Shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this worship service with the Fellowship of Christ. We are a non-denominational movement. I don't like to use the word organization. I am going to start the opening with a scripture. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 and 10. <clears throat> God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Last time I talked about prayer requests, there were some people that were sick. I want you to know that it's my understanding that they've now been healed. There are some other people that are sick. So please continue praying for those that are sick and those with family members that are sick. We are now moving into a economic, economically rough time all over the world. So please pray for people that they will have the financial resources that they need, that their means and wants will be that their needs and wants will be met. <clears throat> Excuse me. And pray that they will be spiritually uplifted and emotionally uplifted so that they will understand that their situation is not as dire as perhaps the world would make it out to be as the Lord blesses them with the things they need financially. There are a few people that are looking for new jobs. Um, two of the people I've spoken to have already had interviews. I know there are many others out there that are looking for new jobs. So please pray for these people that they will find the jobs that they need, the jobs that will sustain them emotionally, spiritually, and financially. As we all know, a lot of places like to underpay if they can get away with it. So, our brothers and sisters need our support and our prayers that they will find the right jobs that will be able to actually support the people that are working there. If you'd like to pause the video now to say your opening prayer, we are now going to have our moment of unity. I'm going to read the Shema in Hebrew, and then I'm going to read it in English so that we can all say it together as one, wherever we are, whenever we can, as a fellowship. Shema Yisrael, Yavah Elohenu, Yavah Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yavah is our God. Yavah is unity. Today's message is on fellowship. The scripture that I read, there's a couple things I want to talk about today with this. The scripture I read, it mentions that we are called into this fellowship. Now, that doesn't mean an organization. That doesn't mean that anybody that ever watches this or listens or becomes a Christian or a Latter-day Saint, you know, has to join the fellowship of Christ. We're a non-denominational movement. I really don't have any desire to build a yet another church, and I don't feel like that's what the Lord has called us to do. But he has called us into a fellowship. The Lord named this organization the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. And I remember when I received that revelation, I was like, this is too long. I asked you for something shorter. And I was frustrated. But that's what the Lord said to do, and so it's what I did. And as things moved on, moved forward, I realized that the Lord is obviously way smarter than I am because what are we? We are a church. Not in the traditional sense of a church, like, oh, there's the church building over there. We go to that building or that organization. 
we're a church in a sense that every single person is the church, the body of Christ. And that's the thing that we've forgotten. We see that church is some ambiguous thing, forgetting that we ourselves are the church. So what are we the church of? Jesus Christ. And I didn't realize how important that was until I really got into this work the Lord called me to. And I began running into people who believe that there are all sorts of Christs. And Jesus is just one of them. And I personally can understand that on some levels. But there's only one Jesus Christ, Son of God, who died for our sins, atoned for us, was resurrected so that we may be resurrected. And that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so this is his movement in the sense that we are his. We are his church, no matter what organization you belong to or don't belong to. So what is it we do as a church, as a body of Christ? Well, we fellowship. We fellowship with other Christians. We are a Christian fellowship. So really, the Lord knows all. This is the perfect name. We've shortened it to the fellowship of Christ, to be perfectly blunt for marketing reasons, not because we're trying to sidestep God. He does call us the fellowship of Christ in some of the revelations that we've received, many of them, in fact. <clears throat> but people get so hung up on this idea that we have to be a church. But I don't want to get into that too much today. The main thing is, if you're here and you're fellowshipping with us and you want to be a member, then... To remember, I just want to, want to talk about this a little bit. Our bylaws, which are in Doctrine of the Saints, Section 3C, in Article 5, it says, Membership in the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship shall be eligible to all who give evidence to their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and who voluntarily hold to the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. When a person chooses to be a part of the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship and involve themselves, they are automatically considered members. So, in other words, anybody who says they're a member is a member. That doesn't mean that they represent us, but we're a non-denominational movement, so we're very open. It goes on to say, a member who is one who attends regularly, should be watching these videos, for example, serves at and contributes financially to the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. So we do accept tithes and offerings. It's, we need them to buy the equipment and keep the website going and, and other things like that. And can answer the following questions in the affirmative. I'm sorry, yes, in the affirmative, did I say that correctly? Now, just to be clear, this is a modern language version of a revelation that I received back in, I believe, 2015. It might have been 2016. But these are, if you will, if you're familiar with the Brighamite tradition, they have temple recommend questions. This would be our equivalent to those temple recommend questions. Number one, do you desire to come into the fold of God and be called a member of his fellowship? Number two, have you confessed your sins to the Lord and repented of them? Number three, are you obedient to the laws of the land? Number four, are you willing to bear another's burdens that they might be light? Number five, are you willing to mourn with those that mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort? Number six, are you willing to stand as a witness of God at all times and in all things and in all places that you may be in, even until death, that you may be redeemed of God and be numbered with those of the first resurrection, that you may have eternal life. Pretty simple. So, if you desire to come to the fold of God, Christ must be in your heart. Otherwise, why would you come? And we accept all. If he's not there, you must have some sort of yearning, and so come and worship with us, and we'll help you get there. That's, that's how we get close to Christ. Remember what Jesus said, when two or three gather in my name, there am I. Have you confessed your sins to the Lord and repented of them? Jesus tells us in 3 Nephi that the sacrifice he requires now is for us to come to him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, which is to say, in Teshiva, desiring to return. When we desire to return to God, 
we want to let go of our egoism, our pride, and give ourselves fully to Jesus Christ, that we may be perfected in him. And the moment that we do, we are. And because of that, because God loves us so much, he doesn't wait for us to change. He teaches us through the Holy Spirit little by little and changes us. Because as we let go of our egoism and pride, we can't help but let the light of Christ shine from us with Christian altruism, where we want to bless and help others. We want to give of ourselves instead of taking. Are you obedient to the laws of the land? There are scriptures, many scriptures that talk about obeying the laws of the land. That doesn't mean the laws of the land are right or correct, but as Christians, we obey them. Are you willing to bear those burdens that they might be light? Again, that is the Christian message. If you want to learn more about that, read King Benjamin's address in the beginning, first couple of chapters in the Book of Isaiah and the Book of Mormon. That's the whole point of being a Christian. Read Acts chapter 2. We're supposed to do what we can to help others at all times, giving of ourselves just as Christ did. Are you willing to mourn with those who mourn? And comfort those that stand in comfort. Both Paul and Alma talk about this. We can't just be Christians and be happy for all things at all times. When people are sad, we've got to be sad with them. We need to be there for them. It isn't just the physical needs. It's their emotional, spiritual needs too. But it's not just that. It's also having joy with them when they have joy. Can we be there for other people in Good times and bad, as they say in the, in the marriage vows, at all times, or to at least to the best of our abilities. And as Christians, we are disciples of Christ. So the sixth one, we stand as a witness of God at all times and in all things. And everything we do, we are representing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How best can we serve him? By living our lives. We don't need to be standing on the street corner yelling people that need to repent. We just need to love people where they are and accept them as they are. And by loving them, that allows them the time that they need to reflect on themselves and decide for themselves what they want to do. They want to come to Christ. And then it, the this article ends with Membership, ordinances, callings, and fellowship are open to all, regardless of race, gender orientation, sexual orientation, or marital status. We invite all to come unto Christ, everyone. It doesn't matter if you're heterosexual, homosexual, cisgender, transgender, non-binary, married, single, polygamist. We love all. We're not going to tell anyone how to run our, their lives. And this is why I chose to read verse 10 in 1 Corinthians. Uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 1. Because one of the things that people like to say about the fellowship trying to, to fix us is that we should all have the same doctrine. Let's see, what's it say here? Speak the same thing. Be perfectly joined together in mind and in the same judgment. And some people misunderstand this to think that this means that we need to judge the same people together. Well, if you read Matthew 7, 1 through 5, it talks about the fact that we're not supposed to judge people. And if you read the Joseph Smith translation, in his version, he says, unless it's a righteous judgment. What's a righteous judgment? Righteous judgment is when we judge ourselves. Now, yes, if you're in a situation where someone has a gun pointed at you, you need to make a judgment call. This person likely trying to kill me. Maybe instead of giving him a hug, I should run away. But it doesn't mean we judge the intents of their hearts. We just judge what we need to do in this situation. And to properly judge, we judge based on what the Holy Spirit tells us. And then we still don't judge them. I've talked to people where the Lord has told me point blank, this person is not going to repent, at least not anytime soon. 
So do I say, sinner, you're going to hell. you got to fix your ways. No. I love them. There's a rabbi that was asked one time, how do you obey all 600 plus commandments that are in the Torah? And he said, pick five. Focus on those. Don't worry about anything else. I think that's great advice. And the problem is that we like to see the sins of others rather than looking at the good things that they do. So when we, re when we read that ye all speak the same thing, what if that same thing is love? What if that same thing is acceptance? I love you where you are and mean it. I know there are people that I say that to and they think that I'm insulting them. But I mean that. I love everyone where they are because that's where God loves me, where I am. I'm not perfect. I mess up. But the Lord is still here for me. Jesus is still atoned for my sins. And I'm still growing in grace the best of my ability through the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus Christ. Because it's not something I can do on my own. There is no works we can do on our own. Jacob talks about that in the Book of Mormon. So if we speak love, then it doesn't matter what our theologies are. It doesn't matter our definition of the Godhead or any other things that divide us. Definitions of marriage. It seems like those are the two big things I run into a lot that divide us as Latter-day Saints. Polygamy and your definition of God. Um, Joseph Smith had what, six different definitions of God in his lifetime. So, I mean... The Church of Jesus Christ in his day only lasted from 1830 to 1844. That's 14 years. And, yeah. How many times did the nature of God change? So if they can change that many times in 14 years, I think that we, as saints, can accept one another with our different views and defi different definitions and theologies of God. And as far as marriage goes, I only have one qualm personally, and I don't care if you're a monogamist or a polygamist or something else. If you think you own the person that you're with, it's not a marriage. It's, it's basically slavery in my mind. If you think that collecting people is going to help you get a higher degree in heaven, that's, that's not how this works. There's Jesus at home for our sins. He did it for all of us. We're not going to get some higher degree of heaven just by marrying much people. But if you want to believe that, you're still welcome here. I'm just telling you my beliefs. I'm not going to argue with you. I love you where you are. But as saints, these are the things that we argue about constantly. Because it's what Satan uses to divide us. So if I can love and accept you as a Trinitarian... If I can love and accept you as a polygamist, even though I am not a Trinitarian and I am a monogamist, can you accept me knowing that I have no plans or intentions of entering polygamy and I have no plans or intentions of changing my theology, my views on God? If we can love one another to do that, then I believe that we are speaking the same thing, that there be no divisions among us that we may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Because all things are done by love. In various different Latter-day Saint churches, they'll teach different, different laws. You know, there's the law of Moses and the law of Christ. And what's the law of Christ? What's the doctrine of Christ? Well, for me, I know, I, I just go straight to the scriptures where it says, this is my doctrine. Repent and come unto me. That's it. It's pretty simple. Excuse me. But how do we come unto him? How do we come unto Jesus Christ? That's where we get divided. So some people talk about a law of chastity, which I don't think is a bad thing. I can't find it in the scriptures. But, you know, if that's what you believe, I, I love you where you are and I, I support that. Go for it. Some people believe you have to have a, a law of consecration where you give up everything that you have to a organization. 
If that's what you believe, I love you where you are. Go for it. If, if you, you can do that, that's wonderful. The law that I personally teach for the fellowship of Christ is the law of love. When I look at the message that Jesus Christ gave us, the overall message, when he said, repent, come unto me, he said that the two great commandments are love God and love your neighbor. And then at the end of Matthew 5, he taught us what perfection was. He said, love your enemies. Anybody can love your friends, but if you can love your enemies, just as God Let's it rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous, the wicked, the wicked and the just. If we can be like that and love our enemies, and help them, and take care of them, and be there for them, even though they're not there for us, that is the very definition of perfection. Jesus died for the Jews that killed him. Jesus died for the Romans that hung him on that cross that tortured him. If we're Christians, if we're going to pick up our own crosses and follow him, then we must have the same kind of love for our enemies that Jesus has. And I know it's not easy. It's probably the hardest thing he asks us to do. But once we partake of his love, it gets easier, I promise you. So to me, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the other name for it, you can call it the plan of happiness. It's called that in the Book of Mormon. I call it the law of love. If we can love one another and truly love one another and truly accept people where they are and not just say that in a dismissive way, then we are Christ's. And we are a fellowship, a Christian fellowship, and we are his church. So I want to wrap up by telling you that if you feel called to Jesus Christ, whether that be in body or in a ministry, the fellowship of Christ being a non-denominational movement, we will baptize anyone to a non-denominational baptism where you're just coming to Christ and no obligation will baptize you and confirm you and give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. No strings attached. You can walk away and never have anything to do with the Fellowship of Christ ever again. If you wish to join the Fellowship of Christ, we're, we're going to ask you those questions that I read earlier. But if you want baptized, we will do it. If you feel called to the ministry, we will ordain you. We do a Priesthood 101 course that we offer that we ask people to take first. It's free. And the reason why is because we want to help you understand what you're being called to. It does teach Mormon Kabbalah because we are a Kabbalah, a Kabbalistic movement. If you feel called to the ministry, we will ordain you a non-denominational minister. If you feel called to do work here in the fellowship, to baptize others along with us, someone that we can reach out to and say, hey, this person in your area needs baptizing, this person in your area needs ordaining, this person in your area needs the temple rituals, they need their endowments, we will provide them. Again, no strings attached. We want to bring people to Christ not an organization. We need help. So if the Lord calls you to help us, great. If he doesn't, he calls you to do some other work, that's great too. We accept you where you are. But we want you to know that we are here for you. And we will do everything we can to help you succeed. That's my message for you today, that we learn to be one in Christ, and that be our core doctrine, love, be our theology. 
so that we can move forward together as one in Christ. And stop worrying about what organization somebody belongs to. And it's my prayer that we can do this. I'll leave this message with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacrament, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. I want to thank you for coming today, for taking the sacrament with us, to those that shared in partaking the sacrament. I feel like that's probably the most sacred of our obligations as a movement is to be able to offer ordinances to those that need them, like baptism, like the sacrament. I want to close today with a scripture and a prayer. The scripture I'm going to read is Helaman 6, 2, 121 REV, 6, 3B, OPV. And they did fellowship one with another, and did rejoice one with another, and did have great joy. It is my prayer that as we can abandon our theological wars, and fellowship together as saints wherever we are, that we too will rejoice one with another, and have great joy. Let us pray. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads before thee at this time to thank thee for the opportunities you have given us to worship together in your name, to fellowship one with another, with the saints of Christ, to thank you for the atonement of your Son, Jesus Christ, the opportunities that this has given us. For the sacrament of communion, we may have the opportunity to fill thy spirit together with our fellow saints and the technology that we have. We have brothers and sisters scattered all throughout the world to join with us in fellowship in these services. If it wasn't for the technology that you have blessed our lives with, this would be impossible. We are so grateful that you have blessed us with the science and technology to allow your work to move forward. We ask that you would help send this message far and wide to those that are seeking you and your son, Jesus Christ, but cannot find a home. Please bless these spiritually homeless, that they will feel your love 
in this fellowship, whether it be as a part of the fellowship or merely by watching these videos and knowing that they're not alone. Please help them to find their fellow saints locally and online so that they have people to worship together with, people to talk to about their needs, emotional, spiritual, financial, and in every aspect. You have promised that when things get dark, the very ground that we walk on will be holy. We ask you to please fill us with thy spirit to remind us of this promise. So that we can have hope in Jesus Christ. Please comfort us. Please comfort our souls in Christ. Help us to know everyone that's listening to this prayer, everyone that needs to hear this prayer. Help them to know that they are loved. That there is a place for them in your home and in your name. That they are good enough. Again, we thank you for all of your blessings. Thank you for all the opportunities you've given us. And we pray these things in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen. Thank you again, whether it be on Saturday or Sunday or any other day of the week for joining us in these services. Please know that we're praying for you and that we love you. And we'll see you again next week. God bless.